Good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, I'm in, absolutely delighted to introduce the final panel entitled Documenting the Experiences of Refugees and the Displaced. My name is Atia Ahmed. I'm an assistant professor here at GW in the anthropology department. I'll be chairing this panel. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce our panelists. First, we have Zainab Saleh from Haverford College. Um, she'll be followed by Nell Gabiam from Iowa State University. And then finally, we have Wendy Perlman from Northwestern University. Okay, so after they've given their talks, which will be between 10 to 15 minutes, we'll open it up for a Q&A session. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to start by thank, uh, thanking uh, Mark Lynch and uh, Shayna, uh, Kate, and Alexandra for organizing this, uh, inviting me, and being so patient organizing the whole event. Um, so my talk today uh, is going to focus on Iraqi exiles in London. I did field work with Iraqi exiles between 2006 and 2008. Um, and I'm going to touch upon different like uh, questions related to Iraqi experience of refugeeness of a refuge uh, in the region, not only limit, uh, limited to the um, to England. And I'll, I will comment like why I'm even using the term Iraqi uh, exile rather than Iraqi refugee um, uh, later on. So just I would like to give a historical context uh, about the emergence of the Ira of Iraqi exilic communities, uh, whether in the region or in Europe. Um, so. Um, Iraqi, like, Iraqis didn't have an, a history of mass migration like Syrians or uh, Lebanese. So most of the Iraqi really experience, um, Iraqis like really had more uh, an experience of refugees. Like people were forcefully deported or expelled from Iraq. And you had like the Assyrians at one point in the 30s, 40s that they had to escape Iraq. Then you had the Jewish exodus. And then they were like sometimes, um, um, the expulsions of certain uh, politician, uh, uh, political figures, but really in terms of like a massive, except with the exception of the Jewish experience, the massive ex uh, uh, flight from Iraq began only in the late 70s with the rise of Saddam Hussein to power. Um, and uh, and then at that time you began to have a lot of uh, uh, political activists fleeing, and then you began to have the mass deportation of the so-called Iraqis of Iranian origin who were deported to Iran. Um, and then and throughout the 80s, so the late 70s really witnessed the first mass exodus of Iraqis from Iraq, and this is when really the Iraqi community in London began to emerge. Um, and throughout the 80s, uh, traveling in Iraq was banned, so people couldn't really flee Iraq. You had to be smuggled, so you couldn't leave willingly. Uh, so that like put more of a limit on uh, on the massive uh, flight. And then, of course, after 1991, with the invasion of Kuwait and the Gulf War, you had massive. Uh, uh, influx of refugees, whether in Saudi Arabia, a little bit in Syria, but also the United Kingdom began to give more refugee status to uh, to Iraqis and uh, who were arriving in London or were in London at that time. So this is when really you began to have the emergence of the huge Iraqi community um, in London and Syria and in Iran in particular. And of course, after 2003, you began to have, like it became much more difficult to to have access to England, for people to get visas to go to England for fear that they, was, they were going to apply for, for asylum. And it's the same with the United States, that Iraqis are not really usually welcome uh, even to get visas, like either, because the fear is that they are going to apply for uh, refugee status. Or for, for asylum. Um, and when we talk about Iraqi refugees, of course, like there's the other problem, big uh, uh, problem is that not only like refugees or Iraqis fleeing Iraq, but the problem of internal displacement um, within Iraq. And this has been really happening since the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And one of the important things is that clearly this, the displacement of Iraqis within Iraq can be like go through stages and like people usually like are not in, only displaced once but more than once as um, Adriana said um, and the other thing is that like again now we don't hear about the Iraqi refugees in Damascus or all, even the internally displaced people within Iraq because for example with the latest uh, fights in um, in Fallujah, like now people are displaced again. So a lot of people from Fallujah are displaced and they are trying to go to Kurdistan, but it's not easy for them uh, to do that because you need sponsorship. Like you can't just walk into Iraqi Kurdistan. You need someone who's sponsoring you. 
So <clears throat> that's like the general context of the experience of Iraqi uh, refugees uh, slash um, exile. And uh, one of the things I do in my research is that I really try to document the kind of the Iraqi Iraqi exiles uh, experience through, through like one of the main things for me is like really how, how can I humanize and individualize Iraqis rather than treat them just as this like herd of people who were displaced and who arrived in England or somehow. Um, and one of the main thing about like really my purposes of like humanizing Iraqis is really to, uh, to to bring to light the richness of their history, the richness of their stories, and also the, the reason for their flights. Uh, so one of the things that I really focus on is like the stories of flight, persecution, and also like anxiety about family who was left behind in Iraq, and like family members who disappeared under Saddam Hussein's regime in 1980, and then they have no idea about what's happening to these uh, families. So there are like all these really stories um, that are usually missed when we talk about like just the general term of refugees. Um, so like one of the things I try to do in, uh, through, through ethnography, not only to have access to Iraqi stories and the whole question of life under, under Saddam Hussein's regime, but also the question of how um, these Iraqis who live in London uh, uh, also like remember Iraq, talk about Iraq and experience their uh, refugee um, status. And uh, one of the things that I really also like um, try to focus on is when you talk to Iraqis in London, they don't want to say, if you tell them you are refugees, they get very offended. They always say we are exiles, we are Bukhtaribin, we are not Lajeen. Um, and to them, like, it's really like to them, when, if you use the word refugee, it's you are dehumanizing them. You are just treating them as a herd. And also it makes them, like, it's just like this, you have pity on them. And they are like just these uh, miserable people who were displaced for some reason. So like there is, and I think like there, there is really some perception in this in their uh, uh, in their attitude which is that there's depoliticization of the cause of their uh, of their uh, displacement that they were really like displaced for political or became uh, they had to flee for political reasons and uh, of course the political reason is Saddam Hussein's persecution but that's again like when we talk about Saddam Hussein's persecution and one of the things I do I try to do in my and my work is also like to show the history of um, of the support of the U.S. government uh, and Western government, sorry, Western governments, and particularly the U.S. government of Saddam Hussein's regime at one point. So it's really when we think about the Iraqi experience, uh, in, at least in England, when you think of like really this displacement happened not just because, uh, like it happened because for political reasons, and also these political reasons are also tied to imperial politics and international politics. It's not just about local politics or about Sunni versus Shia versus Kurd uh, conflict. And so that's one of the other things that I try to do, is to historicize the whole issue of Sunni, Shia, Kurdish uh, divisions. Because to say just like these Iraqis left for ethnic and uh, religious reasons is again to de depoliticize uh, their uh, their blight and the, and the reason for um, for their uh, flight. So in a way, I try to politicize. Like of course, any refugee or any. Exodus is always political, but I try to politicize it in a different way by bringing into light the question of regional interna and international politics. That really what happened in Iraq, and especially the rise of Saddam Hussein, and that the fact Saddam Hussein managed to remain in power for a long time was because of the support he got from uh, Western, um, from Western uh, governments. And one of the other thing that I, uh, things that I focus on is the question of exilic politics. Because again, when we talk about refugees, it's sometimes as if like these refugees just occupy this insular world. But for, especially in case of Iraqis in Iran and in England, exilic politics had a huge impact on Iraq after 2003, because the Iraqi opposition in London was very powerful. And they like, for example, Ahmed Chalabi and Ayad Allawi, they were in very much close contact with the US government. And they shaped kind of Iraqi politics after the fall of Saddam Hussein. And the thing about the um, exilic politics, it was very much sectarian politics. Like really the Iraqi opposition in England, uh, the main voices that were heard and that the U.S. and the British governments wanted to hear were the sectarian voices, the voices that understood, like, talked about, uh, about the persecution, especially of the Shia and the Kurds in terms of sectarianism. Um, so like to, 
So in this case, like it's really the refugees are not just living abroad and they have no impact. Like, there's no relationship uh, between the so-called host country and and the homeland. But on the contrary, like they they can really play a, a huge role and shape politics uh, in Iraq. And that's what happened really after 2003. So in in England, of course, you had other groups that were very uh, secular, uh, but they were not heard. And there were pr people who were very politically savvy and the nuanced. But the British government or the United States. Uh, or the uh, US government didn't want to listen to them. They really wanted the easy Orientalist uh, binaries, Sunni versus Shia, uh, and you have the Kurds, and these people always hate each, uh, hate each other. And I think after 2003, this discourse became even more uh, dominant when it, when it comes to like the displa displacement of Iraqis, whether to Syria or internally. It's uh, because of ethnic violence. Yes, of course, there is ethnic violence in Iraq, but it's like, how did this come about? So it's, it's again, not to depoliticize it and to essentialize it. Um, so and uh, so one of the things like again to like to uh, uh, to historically say my aim is to uh, through documenting this uh, the this uh, the the stories or the experience of Iraqi exiles in London is to historicize the rise of sectarianism. Um, so, and I, I really argue like sectarianism didn't just happen in Iraq or in exile. Like there were different factors and their emergences in different countries depended on different uh, factors. So for example, in England, one of the reasons why the Kurds and the Shia managed to have more power and institutions and support was because of the multicultural discourse of the British government. So if you are a Shia or a Kurd, then you can, you can have your own, you would have funding to establish your own institutions. While if you are secular, you don't have any funding. So that's like how really Shia and the Kurdish organizations began to flourish in England. And they were like much more powerful and they could organize and reach out to people. Um, and of course, in Iran, like if you are in Iran and you are politically active, you have to be kind of loyal to the Iranian government. Like if you are not loyal to the Iraqi government, they, uh, to the Iranian government, you wouldn't, uh, you would in fact be, be jailed. So Iraq, so that's why like really how like the exilic community was influential. And of course, in Iraq, the other thing that happened, and this is like when really especially people who left after 2003 would talk about, is how in Iraq, Saddam began to really promote religiosity a lot. Um, but it's not like really like sectarianism was as like it was, it didn't become really of an issue after until the, uh, the fall of the regime in 2003. But it's just about the rise of uh, um, of religiosity more in Iraq. So really like the, through the refugees uh, experience or the, exi the, ex the experience of exiles, uh, you can like re historicize also all these um, phenomena that we hear about and like we hear about so many, like again, like uh, short term experts, like especially the media, because no matter how much, how many times academics would say these are constructs and they are ahistorical and apolitical uh, categories like Sunni and Shia. Like the problem is that the media is always reaffirming these um, uh, these categories. So that's something like that's really I try to to tackle in um, in my uh, um, in my research. And uh, finally, one of the things that I would really like to to mention when it comes to to religion again, like how uh, last night we were talking during the dinner about the question of sectarianism and uh, their experience of uh, refugees in the region, like how after 2003, like the, the question of refugees was began to be really tied to sectarianism as well. So like if you are Syrian, are you Alawi or not? Um, and the same thing with the Iraqis, are you Shia or, or Sunni or uh, or a Kurd? And again, like with refugees, uh, like for example with the Iraqi ref uh, exiles in London. Then they had a lot of relatives who became refugees in Syria. And the whole question is how they can be resettled. And of course, if you are a minority, then you, are, you, you have more priority to be resettled. So again, the politicization of ethnicity and, uh, and religion, and like if you are, from my, you are a minority, then you, you are more likely to be resettled. But even with that, you have to prove that you are persecuted. Just the fact that you live in Iraq and that there is ethnic violence, it's not self-evident. Like you have to prove there is immediate threat. So even with that, like it's still the struggle is just to prove that the condition under which you are living are hard, are not taken for granted by these, like especially governments. So I will end at this because I run out of my time. Thank you so much. Thank you.
good afternoon. And I would also like to thank Mark Lynch and Shana Marshall for organizing this and for the opportunity to be here um, this afternoon. So I thought about um, kind of organizing my paper around um, the relationship between crisis and documentation. And I, I thought about kind of going over what it was like to document the experiences of Palestinian refugees. I worked in Syria uh, before the war started and then sort of what changed after the war began. And as I was doing that, though, I realized that um, there's not really a clear cut line between a time of crisis and you know so-called peaceful time. And I don't want to make light of the current situation in Syria, which you know in terms of its extent and the level of destruction and violence and all that. Um, but nevertheless, that I, it turns out that line is not very clear cut, and so I'll talk a little more about that. And so for the purpose of this paper, um, yeah, I'll kind of reflect a little bit on what it was like documenting the experiences of Palestinian refugees in Syria before the war, and then talk a little bit about the, the current moment. So it's clear by all accounts that Syria is in a state of crisis. And one indication of the state of crisis is the fact that close to half of its total population has been displaced as a result of the ongoing war. And of the Palestinian refugees who uh, numbered approximately 500,000 in Syria, uh, you have about 50% of them who have been displaced. Um, you have Palestinian refugee camps such as Yarmouk, but also Ain Atal, Sbeine, who, which have been almost completely depopulated. And as others have mentioned, reports of starvation in Yarmouk and Sbeine, for example, where you still have um, a minority of, of Pal Palestinians who can need to live there. And so before I address the current crisis, I wanted to step back and think about what it was like for me to document the experiences of Palestinians in a time of relative peace. And so Interestingly, when I arrived in Syria in 2004 to carry out research on Palestinian refugees living there, according to UNRWA, Palestinians were going through a crisis, right? There was a Palestinian refugee camps were in a state of crisis. And um, according to UNRWA, basically, poverty was on the increase. The infrastructure of camps was just literally just um, crumbling. Um, um, uh, member state donations, UNRWA member state donations were at an all-time low. And so this was a time when UNRWA was seriously trying to rethink its assistance to, to, to Palestinian refugees. Um, and so as a result of a conference organized in 2004 in Geneva, UNRWA basically decided uh, to, that it needed to transition into an organization that focused a lot more on development assistance uh, rather than sort of its traditional humanitarian relief assistance. And so it's within this context that I started conducting field work and decided to actually focus on this uh, attempt at, at reform within UNRWA. And so I ended up um, conducting participant observation on the NADA rehabilitation project, which was basically UNRWA's pilot project to test the promise or feasibility of sustainable development in Palestinian refugee camp. And the project targeted two camps in northern Syria in the outskirts of Aleppo, so NADA camp and Ain Atal camp, even though the project's called the NADA rehabilitation project. So in terms of access, um, even though these were normal times, um, so to speak, it was actually really difficult to get access to Palestinian refugees, with the exception of Yarmouk, which basically had become more or less incorporated into Damascus. Uh, there's intense, very intense Syrian surveillance, or there was, um, around Palestinian refugee camps. I mean, there is in Yarmouk too, but it, it's so incorporated and so big that it's really hard to sort of monitor the coming and goings of, of foreigners. Um, and that's something that the Syrian government is particularly uh, concerned about. And so, Really, the only way that I was able to conduct field work in Nairab and Ainatal was um, by becoming an UNRWA volunteer and basically becoming a participant in the Nairab rehabilitation project. But um, even then, I had um, I faced significant barriers again from the Syrian government. Even though I had this, I, I was not kind of officially part of UNRWA. Let's say. Um, 
uh, there were all these restrictions. So I could not live in the camps. I could not spend the night in the camps. Um, initially, there were issues about me going into people's houses, but they kind of, that kind of dropped off. Um, and then uh, also uh, during subsequent, um, during follow-up visits, um, so for example, in 2010, I went for a brief follow-up visit. Uh, Syrian authorities basically allowed me one day per camp. Uh, I was not allowed to go into people's houses, and I had to have a Syrian, well, he was Palestinian, but basically a representative of Syrian security services with me at all times. And so you can imagine that you couldn't really, couldn't really interact much with uh, Palestinians in the camp, which was basically the point of, of doing that. Um, and so, and another thing I wanted to mention, I'm going back to UNRWA now, was that um, basically uh, the fact that UNRWA sort of perceived, right, perceived uh, that there was a crisis going on in these camps, I think in terms of my having access through UNRWA, I think that was um, a big part of it. And so actually, they were actually, they were very welcoming of having, I'm an anthropologist, of having an anthropologist in their midst this was a time when they were sort of open to self-criticism and self-evaluation. And so they saw me as somebody who could be helpful. And so that's kind of what opened up that space for me to, be, to have access to these camps and be able to um, uh, sort of uh, study UNRWA in a sort of very close up kind of, of manner. Um, the other crisis that I would like to talk about, which um, in terms of the, the pre-war pre Syria, right, um, is actually the war happening in uh, neighboring Iraq. Um, I mean, we, at least some of us know, or at least it's been documented to a certain extent that, uh, you know, the Palestinian community there that numbered about 30,000 uh, were, I think, almost completely uprooted and sort of becoming refugees again. Uh, for, you know, becoming refugees all over again. And so um, we know about that. But there's a way in which the war in Iraq actually also seeped into the lives of um, Palestinians in Syria, long-time Palestinian refugees in Syria. At the time of my field work, um, you had young Palestinian men from various camps in Syria uh, crossing the border to fight with the insurgency against the, um, the Americans in, in Iraq. Um, and so that, that period, 2004, was basically you know, a year after the US had invaded Iraq, was actually a pretty tense one within Syria and within the Palestinian refugee camps, where in a sense, um, I think at least some Palestinians kind of saw themselves at war with the US, but sort of a war that was taking place in Iraq. But then there were, there were signs of it in the camps. You had commemorations of people who had died. You had, um, I know one example of a street being named for a young Palestinian who died while fighting with the in, in, insurg um, insurgency. So there was that crisis going on. Um, there were also these tensions between the US and uh, Syria, right? So the US accusing Syria of supporting terrorism, also actually accusing Syria of letting fighters cross over to fight with the insurgency, um, accusing Syria of um, playing a role in the Rafiq Hari ass assassination. And so all of this created a kind of atmosphere that I think also had an influence in terms of um, my access as an anthropologist. And not just, I think that also kind of explains the level of Syrian scrutiny um, that followed me, but also I think had also an effect in terms of um, my access to Palestinian refugees and my ability to build rapport with Palestinian refugees, at least the, the, the ease with which I could have done it. I think these were very tense time and sort of influenced that as well. And so I think, when we're thinking about access, um, part of it also has to do, I mean, I was, I went in there as an American anthropologist, and I think that um, the combination of that and not that it's changed that much, but that the US was sort of intervening in very controversial ways in Iraq, in Syria, and actually also in Palestinian refugee camps because they were one of the main donors to the development project that I was um, studying. Um, which also led to all kinds of rumors about why that was, um, I think also affected um, access and my ability to document. So I think our own identity and the countries that we're connected with um, also, I think, 
you know, have an influence on our ability to build rapport and, and, and to have access and to document. Um, let's see. Okay, so now uh, moving on to the current situation. Uh, obviously, the ongoing war in Syria is a much bigger obstacle than any that I faced before. Basically, the uh, my field site basically sort of has become a, a, a war zone, right? And the issue with my work is that most Palestinian refugees, in any case, most of them um, are internally displaced. Um, and sort of a smaller number are, again, you know, refugees all over again have crossed borders, but most of them are, are internally displaced. And so the communities I was involved with and sort of um, have tried to keep up with are actually situated in Syria. And so there's a real issue of, um, of physical access here. Um, and also, uh, there's also the issue of these are not the Palestinian refugees in Syria, they weren't, they, it's not a, an issue where the war has, the current war has produced a refugee situation, right? There were refugees before the war, and so the war is kind of a continuation of that refugee experience. And so I think that also leads to sort of a different kind of, of documentation. And I think it also um, kind of raises the issue of that if you take the long view, um, then maybe we want to talk about an ongoing crisis or a recurring crisis. And I think a lot of people have made that point today, right? Uh, especially if you kind of look at the region as a whole. And so, um, you know, even though the bulk of my research was completed before the war, uh, in terms of, you know, follow-up or sort of trying to figure out what's happened to these communities um, since then and sort of how does that connect to some of the things that were happening before? Really, my only means of communication with Palestinians in Syria is, you know, through uh, the internet or through the telephone. And usually, people are too scared to share anything about what's happening. And so, um, for me, I've sort of I've had to actually uh, depend uh, quite a bit on. Um, international organizations and NGOs, and also uh, on work that's being produced by journalists. And I know there's been some criticism today about some of the shortcomings um, of, of these actors. But I think in these moments of crisis, I think there is something to, there, there is something to say for the usefulness of some of the work that they do. And so I think, for example, um, UNRWA puts out these uh, emergency updates, I think, uh, pretty regularly. And that's sort of been my main source of documentation uh, in terms of what's happened to the Palestinian camps that I used to work in. And actually, um, when I found out in May that Ainatal, one of the, the camps that was targeted by the Native Rehabilitation Project, um, basically has, uh, was taken over by um, rebel groups, declared a military zone, and completely depopulated. I found that out from UNRWA, even though I'd been talking with people in the camp. Um, but that's how I found out. Um, and then, you know, with journalists, the, the, the thing about journalism is that as, as anthropologists, um, you know, we take a long view of things. And we take a long-term approach to actually gathering information, but also disseminating information. There's something to say about that. I think we're able to go into much more depth. But um, in such a situation, it's also useful to have people such as journalists who are in the moment who have the ability and the willingness to go into war zones and to document what's happening. Uh, and then I would also um, basically end with people who are actually in the war zones themselves, right? People who are actually experiencing um, the war, experiencing the crisis, um, that's also been a way of for me to document in the absence of having any kind of access. And so actually Nidal Bitari, who was here uh, earlier, as a, uh, wrote about his experience in the Journal of Palestine Studies. Um, Basem Sirhan, who was on a panel at um, last year's Mesa, also uh, wrote about the experience of Palestinians um, in Syria. And so, um, and it also makes me realize sort of kind of the privilege that we have as, um, as, um, as, as foreign researchers where, you know, when things get too dangerous, we can just kind of leave. 
and and um, and and you know other people don't other people don't have that choice. But also, um, unfortunately, it's during these moments that people who are based um, in these areas, let's say Syria, um, that they get a kind of um, attention that they might not get otherwise because it's it's too it's become too dangerous um, for us. And so um, I would just like to end by sort of bringing up a point that Julie Petit made this uh, morning that I'm still tr struggling with, um, which is, you know, what do you do when sort of, uh, you know, the place that you were examining, your, the place where you're conducting field, or what do you do when it becomes a war zone? Do you just, do you keep documenting? Is that okay? Is that enough? Um, do you have to approach it differently? Do you just, leave and find a new field site? Do you have a responsibility to get involved? And if so, then how? Because I, I realize that just getting involved doesn't necessarily mean that you're making a positive contribution. But um, yeah, so I'll just leave with those, um, with those questions. And maybe you, Wendy, can say a little more about that. Thank you. I wish I could <laughs> have answers to such questions, but um, I'm grappling with them too. So thanks again as well to the organizers. And um, Shane, as one of the organizers, actually offered us a list of questions to think about for this panel. So, um, and there were three in particular that I would like to, to address. And these were, how should scholars relay interview material? Should these accounts be contextualized or reproduced with minimal interpretation? And what is lost or gained in these questions um, or with these choices? So in addressing these questions, interestingly, I won't really be presenting anything about refugees. Instead, I'll present about the idea of presenting, which is, I guess, one way to wrap it up. And rather than talking abstractly about forms of writing and forms of presenting, I thought it might make it a bit more concrete, um, or the only way I could think to talk about it more concretely was to talk about my own experience and different forms of writing I've done based on doing interview material. So this even puts me kind of at the center of the story, which is a bit self-indulgent and a bit uncomfortable, especially because I myself have been presenting Syrian stories over the past year and a half. I know Mark has heard me present Syrian stories five or six different times. But they all tie to talk about what it means to be to be doing so. So when I look at my own um, experience collecting um, long, open-ended interviews in the Middle East over the past 14 years, um, my own writing has taken four different forms. So I'll talk a little bit about each of those forms, kind of the thought process and the general process that gave rise to those different forms, and what I see as some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of those writing experiences, and then some sort of conclusions from the end. So my own first experience in gathering long, open-ended life histories, oral histories, people's reflections, was in the early months of the Second Intifada in the West Bank and Gaza Strip in December 2000. It was before I began graduate studies. I had lived in the West Bank previously and then was living in Egypt, and the Second Intifada blew up. And watching American media coverage, I felt like Palestinians' voices and stories were particularly missing, especially back in those early days when the discourse was, Arafat has put Israel under siege and so forth. These, these stories, I felt, were really missing. And I had a break during my Arabic studies in Cairo. I went back to the West Bank and Gaza Strip and had a tape recorder and just talked to whomever I could speak with and record recorded their stories. I would usually open up an interview asking someone, what has the intifada been like for you? And then just let people talk. I gathered this mound of material. Again, I would talk to almost anybody I could, but I was also looking most particularly for individuals whose experience represented particular issues that were in the news at that time. So I wanted to talk to somebody whose house had been demolished because that was a big issue, or somebody who was a relative of somebody who had been killed to talk about, about that experience, and someone from the West Bank, and someone from Gaza, and someone was a refugee, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, so I, I want to kind of target people who are emblematic to some degree of an experience. I collected all of this material. I came back, transcribed and translated it, and got everybody I possibly could to help me transcribe and translate, including Shira Robinson, who unfortunately isn't here to take, to take credit for that, which she helped me with 13, 14 years ago. 
Um, and in the end, thought, what can I do with this body of material? And decided to put together a book of interviews that was a, basically, as, I, as the first draft, was a series of monologues. I was able to have a picture of most people, and it was essentially a picture of the person who talked, the story that began, I am, my name is, and then four or five pages of basically a very lightly edited monologue, straight transcript, almost raw transcript of that person's stories, lightly edited for some style to avoid repetition between interviews. That was the first draft of this book manuscript. I remember giving it to a more senior colleague to look at and who said, these stories are great in terms of humanizing the Palestinian experience, the real, what it was like to live it, but they're very difficult to understand without some context. Someone mentions checkpoint, or they mention shelling, or they mention this or that. If you are familiar with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you might understand that. Without it, you don't know what these people are talking about. It needs more context. And with that, then I decided, or to address that problem, the question of, how much interpretation, how much of you goes into the story. The only way I could think to do it was by inserting myself as, as narrator. So the second version of this book became an introduction written by me, giving some context to the Second Intifada in general, and then an introduction to each one of these monologues in which I tried to af offer some factual, contextual background on the particular issues addressed in that monologue. So that's what became this book, Occupied Voices, that was published in 2003. What's the advantages and disadvantages? The bulk of the book is personal stories, Palestinian individuals telling their stories, but a big part of it becomes me, this American kid who's running around the West Bank and Gaza Strip with a tape recorder collecting it. That has the advantage of offering some of this factual context that helps the general reader understand these stories, but it raises the question, do you need some American kid running around the West Bank and Gaza Strip in order to be the avenue through which American readers, in this case, can access Palestinian stories? It raises certain ethical issues or, or, or broader problematics um, that I become part of the, the story, too. Another layer to that is this choice isn't just me and how I deal with my material, but there's a third party involved, the maybe the evil stepmother or whatever in the whole situation is the publisher, of course. So once you, you have this thing and you want to get it published, how does the publisher see what is the best way to market this book? And maybe the best way of marketing the book is what you need to do in order to get it published so it gets outside of your computer into somebody else's hands um, also might attach to my identity as an author or certain aspects of it or whatever they see as, as, as the way um, to get it out there. So all of that becomes sometimes a different way of packaging the raw interview material so that it um, has extra layers and coatings which are not that of the, the voices originally themselves. But that was one experience, essentially a book of monologues. Um, with some additions. Um, fast forward 10 years, the Syrian crisis erupts, and I want to go back to my roots of collecting long oral histories and stories and begin doing a series of interviews with Syrian refugees. I was in Jordan in 2012 and then back to Jordan in 2013 and to Turkey for a total of about three and a half months interviewing Syrian uh, Syrian refugees about their experiences in the Syrian uprising. My focus was on Syrian, the Syrian protests, the Syrian rebellion, how it began, how people came to participate in protest, what the experience was like with them. Again, I was basically talking to any Syrians I could find. Overwhelmingly urban refugees did some visit to Zatari camp, but for the most part was talking to people who were um, scattered around in Turkey and, and in Jordan, um, and essentially was asking people, where were you when the uprising started? And then people just talked. So I have a collection of conversations with probably around 150 or so Syrians. These range from 20-minute conversations to hours sitting in a cafe with a group of people that riff off of each other, and I'm just capturing it all on, on, on a recording if I'm lucky, to sometimes oral histories conducted over days or, uh, or sometimes continuing on from, from Skype once I'm back in the United States. This huge mound of, of material. Um, one difference between this and the, the Palestinian project, the Palestinian project was a month of me getting a, about a dozen or so 
uh, stories here with a longer amount of time and also um, having since gotten a PhD in political science where I'm taught that sample size matters, I've also tried to gather lots and lots of stories. So I've tried to search for generalizability, have talked to as many people as I, as I can. So I had this mound of material. What, what to do with it. So far, there are three new forms of writing that I've been working on to how to present that. The, the first is what I'm in the process of doing, which is a new book, which I kind of envision as almost a, a people's history of the Syrian uprising, sort of how, how things began and they developed over time, told through these personal stories. So there are the interviews. I will be taking excerpts from them and trying to use and interpret and synthesize them, not as a series of monologues. In some ways, I feel like this doesn't work as well with Syrians, because whereas with Palestinians, I felt like I had people who were each emblematic of a certain experience. What I'm finding with Syrians is that almost every person has experienced everything. <laughs> every, every imaginable tragedy someone goes through, and the stories almost overlap too much. So many people have gone through the same, the same story. So instead of thinking of myself writing chapters that go through the phases of the Syrian experience, bringing in little stories from here and here. This is how it was in Dara, and this is how one guy said it worked in Homs, and then this is how one person said it worked as a woman, and then this person. So bringing them and stitching them together. Of course, this brings up the aspect that there are severe limits and caveats. I've talked to just one piece of a infinitely pieced together complex ethnic sectarian um, uh, uh, class gendered Syrian mosaic. So I have to be very clear about the limits of who I've talked to and who I have not talked to and what I can do with that. But given that, what can we learn from people's uh, people stories of, of history? So this is a different vision, a, a book that's myself as narrator creating a coherent narrative, but as much as possible through, through personal stories rather than facts and events. Terrific. The last uh, two forms, also with the same body of Syrian material, is um, a couple of other, 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 um, other kinds of writing. So the uh, third then is um, I've written a now two, I guess, so narrative nonfiction essays designed for 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 um, for popular audiences. This is um, cases in which I've come upon a couple, some people whose stories I found to be particularly moving or compelling or charming or unique or in whatever whatever way, um, and felt like, wow, I wanted to write a short essay on that person's story in particular. So this is something where, again, it's a third par party narration in my voice, but an in-depth biographical story of, a, of an individual. So one was a love story of a couple who met on the backdrop of the Syrian rebellion. Um, myself as narrator and them as sort of protagonists of the story that almost reads like fiction, yet it's not, as much as possible using their own words, yet it's not a transcript, it's not a transcript, yet based on the, the interviews I did and recorded. And the second is the biography of a, um, of a fighter who I met in, in, in Jordan. Um, the last then sort of element of or kind of writing I've done, oh yeah, that's right, because it's my job, is um, academic pieces. <laughs> so I somehow have to, to do, the, do what I'm hired to, to do. This is going on online, this video, isn't it? <laughs> OK, um, academic articles written for political science and to make a contribution to my discipline. So in this case, I'm still working with this, ac this, this body of interview material, but have written pieces, as all of us who are academics in the room try to do, to make some contribution to theory building or theory illustrating, or in the case of my discipline, also theory testing. There are bodies of academic literature and thinking these long oral histories, how can I use them to illustrate or probe some sort of really theoretical questions. So there are two, two works I've been, been working on. One um, is a question of how early participants in protest affect the motivations and thinking of sub subsequent participants in protest. In political science and economics, there's this whole literature on cascades that a few early risers take an action and then others follow. Um, uh, participating in the same action. What is it about those first early risers that causes other people to follow? This is a, a literature that often works in mathematical models about the costs and benefits and the calculations that change with each subsequent participant in an activity. 
when I was doing interviews with Syrians, I would hear, hear people say things like, like, um, you know, you'd see somebody else protesting and you'd ask yourself, or I saw other people in my community go out into the streets and I'd say to myself, I need to go out too. When I heard people speaking in those ways, my thinking is, oh my God, that's a cascade model. You're t what you're saying is the mechanism by which early risers affect subsequent participants. So this is in some way how I'm, how I'm using this interview material to, uh, to probe causal mechanisms. There's another piece I'm working on that's more interpretive rather than causally oriented about how a central theme linking Syrian, many of the, of the interviews I've gathered um, is that of political fear and fear not having a single meaning or being a single thing, but there being different faces of fear, different kinds of experiences of fear that people, particip that people experienced before 2011 and then what fear came to be as people broke through this personal barrier to participate in protests for the, the first time and then fear is finally violence became pervasive and normalized and how people coped with the normalization, the terror, and then fear of the future, especially among refugees as they as they look to the, the future and they don't know whether they'll come home again or they don't know what Syria will, will even be. Um, so there I have it, these four different forms. What can I conclude from, from any of this? I would say one, there might not be a single best form of writing to produce and relay uh, interview material with refugees or other, other people affected by crisis. Of course, it differs by the target audience, the very nature of the material, and any material can give rise to various different forms. Um, of course, always aware that material never presents itself. There's no such thing as being unmediated. For those of us who've done transcriptions and translations, you can't even transcribe an interview which is in some way filtered through, through mediation. It's, um, it, doesn't even get from, it doesn't get from audio to, to paper without some degree of, of you as author or, or writer or interviewer or transcriber or translator having, having an imprint on, on that. All of this makes it filled with issues of subjectivity, of mediation, of interpretation. How do we cope with all the problematics this brings to the table? I'm not sure, um, except to be transparent about limits and roles, to be aware of it. And in my own um, experience, as much as possible, to be guided by a sense of empathy, at the very least, for your, for, for your subjects. Um, that might be naive. Uh, um, what, what's one person's empathy might be another person's, who knows, um, yeah, abuse of power. Um, but, but it is a, a guiding principle. And um, if the alternative is not documenting stories, um, that seems to be to be even worse. That part of the process of reacting to refugee crises, our theme for today, requires understanding refugee crises and what would it mean to understand refugee crises without listening to refugees themselves. I'm there. Okay, we're going to open it up for Q&A now. We have two people who are circulating with microphones. So if you're interested in posing a question, we ask that you keep it as succinct as possible, and also that you identify yourself to the people who are bearing the microphones. Uh, yes, hi. Um, my name is Abdul Wahab Kayali. I'm a PhD student of uh, political science here at uh, George Washington. Uh, so the question is for Wendy, but uh, obviously anybody in the panel that can answer. Um, you mentioned marketability. Um, perhaps one of the most important things is assuming that these stories have an audience and that the audience wants to hear these stories. Um, what's your experience been with regards to the stories of Syrian refugees, many of whom feel like Nidal that their uprising, their revolution has been orphaned, that they don't have an audience, um, that people just don't want to listen to their plight. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that um, and, and make their stories marketable, not only to an academic community who, who, who uh, appreciates your personal worth as a researcher, but also to a broader audience? Um, yeah, I, w I wish I knew, and if maybe if someone else has the answer, I'd be uh, right behind you and wanting to know the, the answers. I mean, 
so, so the, the popular pieces that I have written that have been intended for a popular audience, I've gotten a lot of rejections, a lot of, a lot of rejections. And sometimes the answer is, oh, we just had so much on Syria recently. We, we, you know, we're, we've topped out on Syria and we've got so much on Syria. And there's a Syria fatigue, you know? It, so it's, um, so that is, is absolutely a problem. And I guess, I, I don't know if there's a, a benefit or, um, or the costs and benefits of this, but the just degree of, of, of self-publishing and availability on, on the internet. There are blogs and there are posts and there are ways, and when I've tried to get things into more mainstream forms and have not had much luck at all, people always reassure, reassure me, you know, in this day, as long as it has a URL, and it's out there somewhere, then um, things can circulate through our own social networks and so forth. So if, if there's, that allows some navigating and circumventing the traditional gatekeepers of what's marketable or not is that there are ways to just get it online, but then you wonder if it circulates with this, the same people who are already interested and already in agreement and doesn't get to, to much else. So I, I, I wish I knew of ways to, to crack in um, to, to sell Syrian stories, but I, I quite haven't figured it out. Um, either, except that my own strategy has always been to be sort of as humanizing as possible. That that that, that gets people in a um, that. So for, no, so for for example, I, so I wrote this love story that's called Love in the Syrian Revolution, and I, I couldn't get it in anywhere. I ended up putting on the Huffington Post where you have you're able to tag um, words. So the tags are like love. And the, since the couple met over Facebook, it's Facebook. So the hope is that people who are not looking for Syria refugees are, you know, searching in the Huffington Post under love, Facebook, I don't know if there's any other, will we'll, we'll come upon that story by utter mistake and, and see something about Syria. So I think we have to try to be crafty, but um, there are lots of shut doors, and you can only be so crafty when, when they're shut. Mm -hmm. um, I have like, um, with the case of Iraqis, it's again a, a very difficult uh, question. And uh, again, so many times I've heard the Iraq fatigue. There is now the Iraq fatigue. Last year I tried, I organized uh, a symposium on the 10th anniversary of the war uh, in, on Iraq in, at Haverford. And when I was doing that, everyone was like, why are you doing, there's like already Iraq fatigue. And people are not even aware, like when you're talking about people now still internally displaced in Iraq, really? Like still this is going on? And like it's really outside the kind of in, even in academia to some to some extent outside of like Middle East uh, departments, people are not even aware of Iraq and what's happening. Like as if, like now Iraq is forgotten and people are like as if living their normal life back to normal life. So the whole question of marketability of or getting a voice or having people mm -hmm. interested is really difficult and challenging and very frustrating. And even when you give like a nuance to humanizing uh, narrative, but okay, what about the Sunni and Shia? They really hate them, they, they, each other. This has been. Like in Iraq, it's not like any other country. Why is it like that? So it's like, did you really listen? Like, so it's really in, in this way, our work can be so frustrating. And I don't like just to keep going is sometimes difficult. Um, but like, I think what Wendy does is really smart to try to find like a more creative way and doing it through literature and maybe having more access. Um, so, but yeah, I don't have a clear answer either. But it's frustrating, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm in the process now of trying to publish the book, and but the, the like the field work really is about UNRWA's, it's an analysis of UNRWA sponsored development in Palestinian refugee camps and what are the implications of that. Um, and I remember when I was sort of you know working on the manuscript, so many people said, "Oh, it's Syria, and with what's going on now, it's just everybody's going to want it. It's going to be so easy, and it was not easy at all. It took a it took a really long time to finally find publishers who were interested. But also when I would talk to Editors, one of the very first questions would be, um, you know, what about the war now? Like, what about now? What's, you know, uh, what's happened now? Are they still there? And I really felt this pressure to somehow bring the current situation into the story to make it marketable. Um, in any case, it's under review now, so we'll see what the reviewers say, if, if they're satisfied with how much I did of that, if, if, or if, but it, what's interesting to me is that it seemed like, the pressure for me, it seemed like I needed to bring the war into it to make it relevant, otherwise it was just, it was old news, it, yeah, so. Thank you. Dot Ola, another PhD student here. 
Um, I had a question about, it seems as though everyone in some way, although maybe now uh, your research a little less, the questions focus, mm -hmm. I was interested also in talking to refugees about their previous experiences, so how they're living life now, but also um, uh, how, how they, you know, their experiences uh, beforehand. Um, how do you maintain perspective about what those stories represent? And because this is an issue I've been thinking about um, where, you know, people's recollections of the past are obviously uh, colored by what's been happening to them presently. So kind of what do these stories represent and how can we um, also think about that documentation? Um, so it's like really when, after you do interviews, which like in, uh, if you do an ethnography, it's like the, this is the whole process of interpretation and what you can tease out and read into these stories. And also, of course, like, again, like listen to what people really want uh, to say. Because for example, with my experience, generally speaking, with Iraqi exiles in London, like once you start, you ask a question, like how did you come here? And then the answer would be like 40 minutes. Like they really narrate what, like, and most of the time, like they would start with the present and about the Iraqi, the situation in Iraq right now and the whole question of uh, Shia Sunni divide or like the ethnic and uh, the ethnic and sectarian violence and segregation of uh, neighborhoods in Baghdad. So it's just really like trying to, to, re to listen through these stories and see some of the issues that come uh, to the surface. And for example, one of the issues that I, when I went to the field, I wasn't really aware of was uh, in 2006 was like really at that time it was a, mo a very important moment because this is when really the Iraqi, most of Iraqis in London lost the hope of return. So most of the stories were really about we are not going back, especially with the older generation. The younger generation, like it's all about hybrid identities and there's conflict, are we going to stay in England or go to Iraq? But with the older generation, there was really a very uh, sad, real, uh, tragic realization that we are going to, like our the rest of our life is going to be in England and we'll even die here. Even though technically they wouldn't really, like most of their friends and families left Iraq. So this like is just really through the process of interpretation and listening, trying to tease themes and stories or certain important stories and like issues. And like that's one of the like really things I would listen to, especially like I don't interrupt people when they start talking and they wouldn't really like stop, is it because they're really talking about things that are important to them and things that are mean that things are very meaningful to them. Um, so that's my kind of way of dealing with that. Um, no, it's such a such a great question, and I think it's not just the issues of the past that are subject to all of this murkiness, but the present or or anything or people's general reflections. I mean, all I have are people's self representations, what they choose to tell me, which is subject to problems of omission, what's not said, problems of distortion, whether it's deliberate to make somebody look. I was the hero in my neighborhood, you know, or um, deliberate distortion or not deliberate distortion, filtered through memory and trauma. And it's a very murky kind of messy lump of a thing that winds up as a digital audio file. Um, and I'm still also trying to figure out what to what to do with it. I mean, on the one hand, when once you do sort of enough interviews, you can see patterns and commonalities, and that gives you some sense that if if it resonates with a lot of what other people are saying, on the one hand. On the other hand, then you worry, is this hardening into a social script and everybody saying the same thing because it's being in, both internalized and, um, and reproduced as, an, as the refugee narrative or the revolution narrative. Um, so you just keep comparing and I guess triangulating and comparing what you're able to get in field work with interviews with what the published record says with the exponentially larger amount of materials that become available in written or audio or video form out there produced by others um, to compare with what we do have as a record of the past. I think in the Syrian situation that becomes also then another layer of trickiness is if there really was the degree of, of, of fear and people afraid to talk and narrate before 2011, then a lot of things people are talking now about what life was like under authoritarian Syria. Maybe they, these people were not able to talk about or record, or I mean, or a lot of people weren't. Some people were for sure, um, but a lot of people are talking for the since 2011, been talking for the first time about their lives beforehand. Um, 
or in ways that will then become documented and re recorded. So it's, it's all very, 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 very tricky stuff. But at the same time, the alternative is not tapping into this wealth of resources of people's lived experience. So I, we find a way to deal with that messiness. We just have to find a way to deal with that messiness because I think the alternative is even worse. This doesn't quite answer your question, but it makes me think, um, I did carry out some interviews two summers ago. This was in France with Palestinians living in France. And so some of them actually have been come as refugees to France, political, um, <clears throat> seeking political asylum. But in any case, what's interesting from what other people have said is that this was summer 2012. The war hadn't started yet in Syria. And what came out of those interviews, actually, there was a lot of hope for the future, and especially the future of Palestine. And uh, you know, Egypt wasn't in the mess that it is right now. And there was a sense in interviews that you needed to have change in the Arab world at large for there to be positive change in Palestine as well. And it was, it was a hopeful moment. And I think if I had those interviews now, I think what they would say would be very different. Maybe they would look to the past more. I don't know. Sorry. OK, so Wendy, first off, uh, your, uh, your, your social science research is very good. <laughs> you do it very well, so don't be so embarrassed by it. Um, but um, so I have a question for Wendy and then a question for a lot of people. Um, so for, for Wendy, uh, this is like the 17th time you've heard me ask a version of this question, but maybe I'll ask it a little bit differently now, uh -huh. which is that if you want to write like a people's history of the Syrian right. war, but you're only talking to right. refugees on the outside, mm -hmm. and you're not talking to people living in Damascus who were terrified of the rampaging hordes right. of Salafi, Al-Qaeda, drug dealing terrorists who the media told them was coming to get them, are you really capturing the full scale of the fear of the narratives of what goes goes into it. Or for that matter, in the camps, mm -hmm. if you talk to the nice woman on the street corner and the baker and the barber, but not the drug dealers and the pimps and the, the local, you know, the, the, the local war profiteers, um, are you even getting a, a full picture of refugee mm -hmm. life? And how do, you, how do you guard against that? And then for, mm -hmm. for the whole panel, but also for Rochelle and for Julie and for a number of other people, um, I, I, about half a dozen of you have, have basically raised the question of what is our ethical responsibility when observing these horrors and do we record them or do we act upon them? And all of you, uh, as, as from, what I've, from what I've heard, I, I might have missed some of it, you've all had the wonderful rhetorical device of posing it as a question and walking away from it, <laughs> which is what I would do in your situation. Mm -hmm. And yet, I wonder if any of you has a declarative sentence, an answer to that question, how you have done that in your own work, or what you might think would be the appropriate answer to that question, because at a certain point, the question isn't enough anymore. I'll start with the first question to leave the second question to my to my colleagues. Um, yeah, no, ab absolutely, Mark. What I have is something of a of a, a, a people's history of Syrians who participated in, support, and identify with the uprising and have become refugees. Even that, I don't know if I have representation of that. But that is that is the only thing I have have access to. So it will be very clear that this is the story of these these people. It will be the story of of the uprising to people who feel like they own it that it was theirs, absolutely. And that leaves huge, incredibly important portions of the Syrian population with very important and, of course, totally legitimate understandings of this outside the picture. So all I can do is, is be transparent that I can only talk about this little piece. <laughs> I know. But, but I guess the question is, so that, is, it, is, that, is that not enough? Or? <laughs> well, you may not be no, 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 for sure. Some people's history. <laughs> Some people's history. Okay, but well, absolutely. Thank you. That's well. That's well taken. Okay, I'll respond to that question briefly, and I'll respond to it in terms of um, my own work on, on Palestine and both. You know, what are we doing when we're in the field? And you know, like you said, I always raise the question rhetorically. I feel I have to um, because it's something we think about. But there's no perfect answer. But in my case, I always saw work with Palestinians as an intervention. Um, and where voice is denied or marginalized, and you're capturing those voices, you are intervening in whatever small way that we academics do. As long as we don't think we're doing anything too tremendous, I think we're OK. Um, but I, I think we do intervene in particular narratives 
th that's what I hope I do. Um, so that's how I answer that, that question. Thank you all for these very interesting reflections. And I asked, actually wanted to ask you to, maybe all of you in some sense, to put the, the things that you're talking about in the context of yet the, or in relation to the other context where these kinds of narratives, some of the other contexts where these kinds of narratives are recorded um, or presented. One um, being the humanitarian representation of, of refugee stories for the purposes of donation um, and compassion raising, which are which is also a work that is very specifically oriented towards humanizing people, but to a for, to a particular end, which is good and problematic, like so many things. But um, uh, d humanizes refugees as very specific sorts of humans, um, limited in certain ways. And then the other, and this is still a, in some sense a humanitarian context, but a slightly different one where displaced persons have to narrate their own stories for the, for the aims of getting access to either services or asylum or you know, opportunity of escape. And so these are two different components of a humanitarian narration um, of refugee experiences. And I was trying to think actually to link it back to the, all of the panels of the ways that states um, might narrate these stories, and I think they do, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a harder time coming up with a concrete example, but maybe some of you can think of those ways. But these other, these other venues in which the same kinds of narrations that we as anthropologists or political scientists, scholars are trying to capture um, to, to provide a, a different window, um, one, how you see the work that you're doing intersecting with these other forms of narration, how you might be able to challenge or disrupt um, some of the more problematic aspects of these other forms of, of narration, or the ways in which you, your own work, my own work, is necessarily captured by them. Um, I'll go first. Um, in terms of uh, Iraqi exiles in London, it's really the whole question um, uh, of course, their whole like the, their asylum uh, status, or like the fact that they managed to get asylum in the United States, and most of them, even now, they like uh, honestly, most of the people I talk to like have been uh, uh, British uh, British uh, subjects for a long time. Like they got naturalized, but it's still they talk about themselves as like in terms of the uh, asylum application they had to to submit. Um, and like how the, the fact that they were designated as a humanitarian refugees rather than as being political um, exiles, even even if they in fact even when they are designated as political asylum, uh, asyl like they manage to get political asylum, which is like much rarer and it entails more benefits, they don't like the term asylum. They still prefer exile. But in terms of like so, most of their like most of them still live on social benefits. Um, and they don't work like because of language barriers, because of discrimination of or age. Uh, so in terms of my work, I really try to uh, compli complicate the kind of the humanitarian um, uh, discourse by bringing to light like the political aspect of their of their displacement, um, and um, and to show like more their, the complex history within that they occupied, um, and the rich history also like they inhabited um, in Iraq. Um, in terms of narrating one story, this is like, in fact, one of the amazing things. Uh, first, like Ira Iraqis in London really like to talk about their stories because like no one wants to hear, to listen to their stories anymore. So there is like this need to talk, like as if they are really still doing therapy. Like they, are, you, they treat the, the kind of, the, uh, the listener as a therapist almost. But one of the interesting things, not only about, in fact, Iraqis in London, but like also their relatives who are, were in Syria and getting, getting re, uh, resettled in Finland or Australia, is that how much you, again, what I've, what I've said, you have to prove that you are persecuted, so it's not enough to be Iraqi, and also you have sometimes to exaggerate. So one of the, in fact, women I met and interviewed, belong, I'm not going to say which minority she belongs to because I don't want to put her family in jeopardy. Um, her family got re resettled, but they had to claim to fake a document saying that they had a daughter who was killed. Even though they were really harshly persecuted in Baghdad, and like because and they had to leave, 
Um, so again, like narrating how you present your story, and she was saying like her family was really upset they had to lie, but they had to because otherwise they wouldn't be resettled immediately in Finland or like would be immediately like within three years, not like still waiting to be resettled after three years. So it's again like how they narrate stories, um, how the narration of stories um, take different, like, uh, is layered again, like it's not only the, the experience of refugees is layered, like even the story that's being told is layered and how, what aspects sometimes they emphasize or even what aspects they they have to come up with. And in a way, like I couldn't like, I, uh, and like when I say like they, when like especially like she was saying, like when I, when, peop when people say that they lied, it's as if there's immediately a moral judgment, oh, these people are trying to manipulate the system. But the system is so complicated and it's really so discriminatory, like how would you pass any moral judgment? Um, so that's the, the thing about like uh, narrating stories to have access to aid or even to get resettled and not like even keep living um, in, in a in a in a refuge like in a in, in Syria and Damascus and not being able to work. Um. Um, um, so one is because just given the nature of the of my particular topic, since I I have been talking to Syrian refugees not primarily as refugees but as, as Syrians and as Syrian participants and supporters in in the uprising and in the protest, which is interesting in that the, the, so that how I present that and that the questions I ask, it's this moment of absolute agency, which is in some ways sort of the contrary to the the dispossessed, victimized, powerless refugee that gets thrown out in the, amnesty, the emails I get from Amnesty International asking for make, to make donations and, and that sort of thing. I mean, the kind of, the, 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 the phrase that's often used in Syrian or, or doubt the Arab uprisings about how people first came to participate in protest is this idea of, of breaking the barrier of fear and how people came to participate in protest. So that's how I present that the, that's the nature of my, my project. That's the title, and I present asking people. I'm doing a project on what, what bar, breaking the barrier of fear means and what it means to you. And people's eyes light up. Because especially people who are, as refugees who are just waiting, they don't know where they're going, their life is completely uncertain, and utter a sort of feeling of utter powerlessness. It's like, take me back to that moment of perhaps the greatest agency that you felt in your life, or the first time you, you, you felt this kind of agency. And people, I mean, people's eyes will light up. Sometimes they'll cry. People will talk about, it was the most beautiful day of my life when I participated in a protest. I remember one guy saying, you know, it was better than my wedding day. And when I said that to my wife, she wouldn't talk to me for a month. And I mean, people literally, when they remember this protest, and these, again, of course, are just people who participate in, identify, and support the, the rebellion. But it is, it is almost a celebration of agency. And then as the story goes on, it gets to a point of tremendous victimization and, and, and absorbing a tremendous amount of violence and ultimately ending in a place of powerless and uncertainty. So I hope to capture that part of the Syrian experience or their own experience too. But in beginning in a place of agency, I think um, adds a different aspect to what this conflict means to them and also um, it allows them to sort of, the interviewees to, to be in a slightly different emotional place, and I wind up with a story that's that's more nuanced um, than than just victims. So, actually, I think one thing that's left out from, let's say, the UNRWA ads or Amnesty International, the sort of the the, the you know the victimized, dispossessed refugee, um, one group that's left. If we just stick with Palestinians, one group that's left out is the Palestinians who are actually wealthy. Uh, the Palestinians who maybe had a house in a different country and were just able to go there. The Palestinians who have um, citizenship and in, in, in another country. And so, in the research that the collaborative research that I conducted two summers ago in France, uh, the people that I, the Palestinians I interviewed, they were a mixed group, but many of them were, you know, some had French citizenship, some, you know, very educated. Had uh, I mean, Palestinians are educated in general, but um, you know, well to do. Not they, they would not be in a UNRWA ad, basically. And what, one thing that was interesting was um, there was a certain contempt for. Okay, there was an. So also, I'll, I'll go back and say, contrary to maybe Iraqi refugees or others who might see the label refugee as somehow demeaning, you you didn't have that. Mm -hmm. But they would say, yeah, I'm a refugee, but not not an UNRWA kind of refugee. So basically, I'm a refugee in the political sense that. I was forcibly displaced and I will return, but not as somebody receives rations, not as a charity case. And they always, they kind of felt compelled to, to make that argument. Um, whereas in the camps in Sarah where I worked, to be 
being a refugee and UNRWA, that's very, you know, that's very tied. UNRWA is a big part of making that claim to the refugee identity, and there's nothing to, and that's, I mean, it's, that's their way of politicizing it, actually. Whereas um, in France, they would say, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a refugee in the political sense, not in the UNRWA sense. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and also, uh, one of the, uh, one of my interviewees actually had just recently arrived from France. Actually, I sort of, by pure coincidence, I ran into him in the streets of Paris. Um, he had actually was living in Yarmouk when I was doing my research. But in any case, um, he told me about how um, uh, he'd connected with some Syrian refugees in France and how they were very ashamed to admit that they were refugees. And again, I think it's it's because of that image, right, of the dispossessed uh, victim, and so that they would sort of keep it from from others. And he just didn't get it. He, he said he he always identified as a refugee, and you know he didn't have an issue with it. So. Um, it's sort of interesting also how um, the image that organizations like UNRWA, or other humanitarian organizations, the images that they put out there, how others reappropriate them sort of differently. Sometimes in the case of refugees in the camp, sort of in a way that's seen positively and then in other cases in a way that, that, that that's not. Thank you very much. Abbas Kadam with Johns Hopkins. Uh, Zainab, good to see you. <laughs> My question is uh, on, on the uh, uh, two different experiences of uh, trying to extract uh, narratives from people who have an experience. Uh, with the Syrian case, it is too close in time to the events. People are still, you are dealing with people with, with uh, uh, fresh wounds, if you will. Zainab, I assume that you worked with people who had some time af you know, uh, after they left the events that caused them to go into exile. Uh, as someone who spent a year and a half in a refugee camp myself, I, I find you know, this is fascinating. It brings flashes back to, to this. Uh, so how are you going to be, uh, or what is your methodology to try to minimize the unintended distortion that happens to a narrative? Uh, either because it is too close to the events that people are still overwhelmed by, by what goes on, or kind of the passage of time that causes that, uh, you know, deal with uh, too close a memory or too far a memory, and, and, you know, and, and how it operates. And again, thank you for an excellent panel. I can just say um, briefly, and this was great, and I love Nell's um, comment of when she did um, interviews with people in France, and it was a moment of hope, and people expressed hopefulness, and had you done the same interviews a year later, people may have expressed a lot of despair. And I can just say that having done interviews with Syrians two summers in a row, in 2012, there was still a uh, there was a marked greater level of hopefulness than in 2013. In 2012, people were still saying things to me like, next summer when you come back, we won't be here. We'll be back in Syria. Here's my address of how you can come visit us in the village in Dara. In 2013, people were like, someone before was mentioning, I think Rochelle was mentioning Sweden. In 2013, Everyone I said, well, felt like was pulling me aside, saying, how do I get asylum in Sweden? How do I get asylum in Sweden? I'm no longer thinking about going back to Syria. How do I get out of Turkey? So, um, so that was just a very different feel at two different points in time. How to minimize this, if at all possible? This is, I think, we're doing this sort of longitudinal study. If, if I can, I think for my own self, if I can keep going back and a yearly check in with some of the same people, as well as getting new people, at some point I'll have this mound of material and be able to see, and be able to figure out what and what in that was said was a product of that particular moment in time and what has changed and what hasn't changed and so forth. That of course takes, requires a lot of time and resources, but that is methodologically speaking, one way to, um, to, to work around that problem. At the very least you'll be able to track changes. I think in the case of Iraq, it's especially complicated because um, not only in terms of Iraqis in London, in terms of like, especially like for example, like this is some, one thing I would really like to uh, to bring up. For example, the memory of the Iraq-Iran war. Um, I lived, I was in Iraq during the Iraq-Iran war, and everyone hated that time. And like, what the hell is going on? How could be in a war? And in the 90s, during the blockade and when the lack of security, the Iraq-Iran war became like this like wonderful time. Like, so it's really and like I'm for like in Iran there are a lot of studies on the war but in Iraq it's really that memory has 
has been almost erased because you had the 1991, then the blockade, then the 2003. So it's really in terms even of the um, of the stories of people um, in this case in in England. So the ideal thing if you can go over years and do kind of research, um, and uh, but of course that's not always possible. Sometimes in my in when I did field work, it was interesting how like I would interview people like someone. And then, like, we couldn't finish the interview. Like, most of my interviews went on for five hours, some of them 10 hours, 12 hours, because people really just wanted to talk. And then there would be some bad news from Iraq. And they would narrate the same thing or the same story differently, or sometimes on the, like, it's the exact same thing, like, as if they rehearsed the same story so many times. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they are aware of that. And, like, most of the Iraqis, in fact, I talked to were, like, like, especially like to them, the fall of Saddam Hussein's statue, which the, yesterday was the 11th, uh, 11th uh, uh, anniversary, they remembered like at that time we really had a lot of hope. We were so happy. So sometimes people even catch themselves how they remember the past and how like now they are, but they, of course they remember it in terms of being pessimistic or optimistic. So you can get a glimpse um, of that. And sometimes of course, like to me, literature and the newspapers can can help, especially when people are writing uh, at that time about what's happening. So that can give me kind of a view of, especially if I manage to interview the writers, can give me a view of how like really memory has been reconfigured. But it is a tricky thing, and like there are so many ways like you can, you can try to grasp how things change, but sometimes you just cannot. Um. Okay, so this might turn out to be an unanswerable question, but hopefully I'll, try, I'll be able to convey it. Uh, so this is drawing on uh, Julie Petit's introductory remarks uh, about silences, right? Uh, and it also touches on Mark's question about sort of ethical obligations. So all of you have kind of touched on this idea that um, refugee voices can fill up some of those silences um, that would otherwise go unfilled. I was wondering if you could reflect on silences in the refugee narratives themselves, and also the silences that you create in your mm -hmm. efforts to document? Um, in terms of silences, uh, for example, one of, the really, one of the biggest silences I noticed when I was doing field work is that most of the Iraqis, especially like who were very politically active in the 40s, 50s, they didn't want, they didn't talk about Palestine at all. Like they would talk about uh, their struggle in the 40s, 50s against the British and demonstrating, and you don't hear about Palestine at all. So when I brought this issue up, there was like, yeah, like we supported the Palestinians and look what they did in 1991. So this was a huge silence, and if I really didn't hear from my, I don't know, my, from my aunt and my mother, like how Palestine was important and they demonstrated, maybe I would have thought, oh, like if I were not Iraqi, maybe people would have thought this is not an important issue. So, but it was really interesting to see, like there was no mention whatsoever of it. Like it's not even mentioned slightly. Um, another silence, like some of the silences I had to create is really the whole question of, uh, economic, uh, their economic situation. So most of the people I met really invited, like wanted to meet with me in cafes. They didn't want me to meet, they didn't want, um, they didn't want to invite me to their houses because most of them are like council apartments. So they associate with downward mobility. And this is like really something I wanted to bring up, like the whole issue of like economic pressures and hardship. Like they are comfortable, but they don't feel like really they belong to the middle class or they kind of, they they maintain the same level they maintained in Baghdad so, or Iraq. Some of them would say, like, I used to own a house, I used to have a good job, but the most, and one of them, one of the women told me, like, I wish I could invite you to my house, but I'm really embarrassed. It's so modest. So I really, I was so curious about the whole issue of, uh, um, of economic, the economic questions, but I didn't raise it because I felt like I really, I would be uh, putting them in a very uncomfortable position. So I, I needed, like, if they would bring it up, I would ask indirect questions, like some of the difficulties you encountered in London. Um, did you manage to work? Like, try to really ask so many indirect questions. And most of, like, only, like, three people talked about that. Most of the people didn't feel comfortable. Like, they didn't bring it up. Or if I tried to, like, yeah, like, things are, like, unfortunate. Like, look what happened to us. We used to be middle class or upper middle class, and now we are not. But people, so it's one of the signs I created, really just out of consideration. I, mean, I guess I'm, I'm still figuring a lot of this out, but one, one thing is this is not so much in the, the narratives I'm collecting is um, the, the interviews, but just spending a lot of time with Syrians in Jordan and Turkey and sort of other things you, you pick up in that sort of ethnographic context is um, 
it's so common to hear things like basically everybody else is corrupt everybody else is stealing money and not just the international and the non-governmental organizations but every other syrian is also pocketing um relief money and so forth so if everybody else is corrupt and stealing but nobody's telling me about their own experience being corrupt and stealing and the and the wrong they're doing there's some stories I'm not 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 getting. There's I, there's some there's something off there. So no, never have I done an interview where somebody explained to me, you know, this is how I'm stealing money by going to Qatar and collecting donations and pocketing 90% of it. But apparently everybody else is. So so yeah, I'm, and that is one thing is there are lots of maybe unsavory bits going on that um, when I get people to tell me their story, they're usually the hero of their stories and. Um, that's what I uh, am missing more than anything else, I think. So I'm going to talk about silencing as opposed to silences, because that's sort of what came up in the research in France, um, is the way that the categories we use, the research categories we use, sort of silence, um, if not a certain reality, a certain sort of our interviewee's own self-understanding. So the, it was a research on statelessness, right? And so a lot of the questions had to do with statelessness. And I got a lot of pushback um, by interviewees who felt like that term was just a, a projection and just did not capture in any way what it means to be Palestinian, regardless of whether or not they have a sovereign state. Um, and, and so then the, the, the question of the, and, and so I, during a focus group discussion, we sort of kind of went back and forth. Okay, if it, if statelessness just if that's just you know basically a Western imposition, what kind of category really captures what it means today to be a Palestinian? And so we went through patriot, we went through all these different ones, and then finally, um, they basically settled on refugee, but kind of by default that that was kind of the closest in capturing what it means to be a Palestinian. And I think part of why. That's the closest, again, it's because at least implied in that is that you've been forcibly displaced and so that you can make a claim to return. But even that they felt was an imposition. And also one, one thing that came across was that these categories that we use that connects to something you said today, Julie Petit, um, about when we're talking about Palestinians, it's not just Palestinians in Palestine or even historical Palestine, but sort of Palestinians as part of this greater network that the whole notion of state and statelessness also doesn't capture. And so uh, some interview went back to the whole notion of greater Syria. I mean, there's a way in which the very categories, the very language that we use actually silences and, and sort of glosses over rather than uncovers. So that's sort of what came across with this latest research. Hi, uh, my name is Hannah Dannenfeld and I'm a sophomore here at the Elliott School. Um, my question is for you, Wendy. Um, I know you spoke about uh, urban refugees and documenting those stories, and I was wondering if you could maybe talk about some of the differences um, in your approach to documenting the stories of urban refugees versus refugees in camps, and maybe um, the availability or access to these stories um, in these different settings, and then maybe also uh, the differences in the stories you've found. Um, that's great. No, I, as I said, most of the stories I collected were, were with urban refugees, as, as someone was talking earlier, that most of the refugees in Jordan and Turkey are, are urban as opposed to in the camps. Um, in Turkey, I wasn't able to get into the camps. I actually didn't try because people were like, don't even bother to... Um, in, in, in Jordan, I was in Zathari uh, this, many times, my first visit in 2012. And what I found is because I was primarily asking people about their recollections and their narrations of protest in Syria, in, inside the camp, conversations tended to be only about the camp, especially at, at that time. It was, was pre-caravan, so it was just the tents and the, fa the fact the food is so bad and the, and the dust and the dust and the dust and not enough water. And it was just the conversations, it was very difficult to get people to talk about anything besides the camp, besides the fact that it was usually in these tents that were open and people were coming and going and so forth. So the kind of the physical environment that's more conducive for a kind of oral history where you look, in someone, you look at someone and they look at you and the person goes into their own memories was just logistically difficult to do in the camp. So the, although I did do interviews there, they weren't useful for my, for, my, for my purposes. That was the main difference. I wonder if I had some of the same folks from the camp, if I were able to get them in a different environment, if it would 
be the same sort of long oral history, but inside it was it was physically um, difficult. Um, as far as the differences among the the interviewees themselves. I mean, I was struck by the degree of commonality of this narrative of of the of the uprising, which then brings up the question about if this is something of a social script that's been hearted. But to a really striking degree, these individual narratives coalesce into this collective narrative among this pro-rebellion population about why there needed to be an uprising, what it was like during that euphoric early period, how things then uh, became militarized and get to this point of, of despair. So although the, the individual details vary from people from the north and the south and people rich and poor and so forth, there is, at least among the people I've talked to, uh, a strikingly shared um, understanding of what it all means. Thanks, everyone, very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.